Thank you for the introduction. Um, so as you heard, my name is Vesdan Petkovic. I worked at LinkedIn, Python Foundation team. And uh, we're going to talk today about how we brought Python 3 to LinkedIn and what were the obstacles to that. So let's start by looking. This thing is now at pause, of course. Let's start by looking at the overview of, of the talk. Uh, I'll try to uh, present this in a way that's useful to people in other companies that have similar problems and, and similar needs. Uh, of course, wherever there is something very specific to LinkedIn, I will stress that. So the introduction will kind of go into a motivation and goals and things that you can justify to your management. Why would you need and want this kind of change? And uh, then we're going to go into specifics of how did we do it at LinkedIn. And there will be maybe some things that you will have to change for your own use case uh, compared to us. But it will give you good ideas how that can be done. Uh, we'll talk about challenges that we met. Some of them we anticipated, some of them along the way we figured out. And then eventually I'll present how did we port the code and what are the issues with that. And there will be lots of code examples shown of the code that is difficult to port and how you can go about fixing that maybe early rather than late. So because this is a fairly fast-paced talk, there will be a lot of stuff to cover. If you want to see interesting things you, and not fall asleep during the lunch, uh, after the lunch um, and see the code, I will have to go pretty fast. But that's how much you will remember after it. So let's go and uh, look at our motivation and goals first. So what we wanted to achieve here are the things at the top. Of course, we didn't have them. And that's why we wanted them. So problems were that, for whatever reason, we depended on Red Hat system Python, which was Python 2.6. And it was kind of hard coded into our build tooling. And when we wanted to go to Red Hat 7, somebody said, oh boy, it has only Python 2.7. It doesn't offer 2.6 at all. So what do you do now? Well, at the same time, we were thinking, hey, Python 2.6 is deprecated. And we want to get away from it anyway. By now, it's even not able to negotiate TLS connection correctly. So we are in a position where we want to change the things because of the operational side, but also because of just development side and the progress, basically, that you want to make. Other things that were popping up is we have this uh, command line tooling that was deployed as a relocatable virtual environment of a bunch of Python programs, hundreds. And sometimes a creative soul would make a script that's going to be one off, but after a couple of years it becomes really important. And they use a package from that virtual environment without telling you that they depend on you. You remove that package, or you change the version, and suddenly, oops, something's wrong. You have to roll back your deployment. And we wanted to avoid these kinds of things, to have that transparency as well. So what do we do? We decide we want to uh, move forward. Now, do we move only to Python 2.7, because Red Hat 7 offers that? Or do we go and do something more? I get you. You want Python 2.7, but why Python 3? Well, it turns out we had some really uh, mission-critical teams that wanted newest and greatest features, like async I.O. and type checking, things like that. So we decided to go full way forward. However, because of the nature of our company, and any big company, honestly, you cannot just cut over. Our mobile app has to deploy three times a day in three hours tops. If we cut our Python tooling suddenly and stop it for three months because we want to change something, they're not going to be happy. That's not agile. That's not moving fast. So we had to do it incrementally. We had to enable every team to incrementally change their things. So that was one of the things that we wanted to provide, that we have support for multiple Python versions but also that people can move at their own pace and that we can um, 
break the dependency on vendor Python without uh, breaking us, and that we can migrate libraries at our own pace. As you notice by now, I'm not gonna read you slides, so please feel free, read the slides. I'm gonna just add the backup story. So when you look at, at the problems that we are facing, there are two really issues. One is how do you provide multiple Python versions on your infrastructure? And the other one is how you support code that supports multiple versions of Python at the same time. The right side, there are existing solutions over the last decade, and we didn't want to change anything in that regard too much. But we had to adopt it, of course. That's kind of a, a hard part of porting, the last step in that overview. But also, when providing multiple versions, you, you can go two ways. One, do you go with vendor-supported Python again, multiple versions, or do you go with your own clean Python build? So what we decided to do is look what would be our options. And it's really convenient and really appealing to use something that the vendor provided for you. For example, Red Hat provides the software collection, so you can install Python 3. Great, but we still have applications that run on 2.6, and for a considerable period of time, they will still have to run on 2.6, at that time when we were thinking about this, of course, not anymore, but at that time, yes. So what do you do? Well, Red Hat 7 doesn't have a software collection for 2.6, so you have to build it yourself. Mm -hmm. Now we have to build it ourselves, so why don't we just build it ourselves? That's a disadvantage, actually, of the vendor Python. Now, suddenly you have two different platforms. You have maybe two different paths on the same platform for different versions of Python. You, you're introducing customization to your build tooling anyway. Why not control your life completely? So that's the advantage of the clean Python build. You isolate yourself from any changes of the vendors. Uh, other thing that, I, that you probably noticed on the slides is that vendors sometimes patches Python or packages for their own needs. Yum uses Python, right? So they may patch it for some need of their own. And you have so-called tainted packages or libraries. Or somebody installs a legit RPM, Python RPM. Say, request 207. But your application really needs request 213. And because somebody with super user privileges installed that, they tainted basically Python, and now you, you have a conflict. So these kinds of things are avoided with a clean Python build. No site packages, any, everything is empty. You add them into application in a little container that application carries all its dependencies with it. And you control updates, you control everything. Now, one problem is you have to maintain that build. You have to decide how you're gonna deploy it, and you have to follow the security uh, fixes closely. How to support code for multiple versions? Well, again, two issues. Deployables, libraries. Deployables don't need to support multiple versions. Uh, uh, there's no sense running application with two different versions of Python in production. But libraries have to, because base libraries, especially at LinkedIn, may be used by hundreds of applications. And one of them may, may be running with 2.6, another with 2.7, and another with 3.5 or 3.6 now. And you don't know which one. So your library have to, has to support all of them. Uh, we literally have 1,500 products that use Python or one way or another. 1,000 products around 1,000 that use Python exclusively. So you can't force all of these people at once to switch immediately to, to one version. So your libraries have to support. But over the last decade, as I said, lots of tooling has been developed that handles that automatically kind of translation with a couple of gotchas that we'll see later that you have to manually tune. But after that, you have so-called straddling code. Guido and Rossum used that, that term when we talked about this, and, and it's exactly straddling code because it, it's a bridge between the two worlds that you just cross like a little creek. And uh, it uses six package. You know the reason for this name six? So five was taken on PyPy. Two plus three is five. 
So five was taken, and two times three is six, so they took six. Um, that's basically the reason for that package name. But Python Modernize is a tool that will run over your code, migrate most of it, use six where necessary for this compatibility, and you will have a code that will mostly work with both Pythons. Then you will run your tests, fix a couple more things maybe manually, and you're ready. Now, if after all of this you still need to justify to your manager return on investment for this kind of change, there are a couple of suggestions that you can give them. So I mentioned botched backport fixes. So uh, long-term versions of Linux distributions tend to backport the fixes from new Python versions. Sometimes binary incompatible backports happen, and you have to rebuild hundreds of things because of that. I've experienced that at least once. And that's not going to happen anymore when you do this kind of stuff. Um, strange interactions with, with vendors' packages that are different versions than what you need. All of these things you, you're going to avoid. And then you're going to enable people like your mission-critical teams to use new features and to be ready to not scramble again in 2020 when you really want to go to Python 3 because Python 2.7 is going to be shut down. And you kind of want to lead the community, right? So let's see how, how did we do this. Several requirements that we had was, hey, we want several clean Python interpreters for different versions. Um, we need to migrate our code for our libraries. And of course, as we migrate the applications themselves, but that doesn't need to be a straddling code. We need to provide a testing with multiple versions for libraries so that the compatibility is maintained all the time, automatically. And then dependencies are different for Python 2 and 3. Let's say your Python 2 program depends on Enum 3.4. That's a backport from Python 3.4. Um, but you don't need it with Python 3. Maybe it will work, but I know one that won't work. Subprocess 32 will actually bail out if you try to build it with Python 3. It will just cowardly refuse to build. So those kinds of problems have to be solved. So let's look first at the, at the Python interpreter. So what we've decided to do, we decided to create several products for each version of Python x.y, so let's say 3.5. We build a product called Clean Python 3.5. And that product is a pure C, C++ kind of compilation thing that takes standard Python from python.org uh, as, as an input uh, tarball and then uses Gradle plugin for C, C++ to compile it and produces an artifact that's a deployable Python version. However, because we use multiple platforms multiple OSs inside the company, we have so-called multivariant builds, which is a matrix build, so that it produces artifact for Red Hat 6, Red Hat 7, Darwin, whatever is needed. Uh, also, we took care to provide native packaging formats. So Tarball is fine. You can unpack it. You can still use that interpreter. But you know that sysops like basically, hey, give me my RPM or give me my PKG. The guy who maintains our Mac uh, laptops was so happy that we provided PKG for him. So that was really good. Um, and then where do they fall in place? It's up to you. You will decide, do you use slash OPT? Do you use slash export? Wherever is that three dots there at the beginning and then Python dot X dot Y slash X dot Y and then bin lib and other places. Basically natively compilation falls in that place. Now, that's a pretty consistent path for any version. The only difference is x.y. Um, that basically provides all the things we talked about before. Code migration. As I mentioned before, we have to keep compatibility across the versions. So for the libraries, we started with one Python web app. They are kind of representative of a, of a big thing with lots of dependencies. So we looked at the whole graph, whole three of dependencies, and somewhere at the bottom, 
were the internal LinkedIn libraries that depended only on third-party packages such as requests or subprocess32 or whatever. And we started by modernizing them. And once we finished that, then those that depend only on one on, of internal dependencies, and then up and rinse and repeat until you reach the top of the graph with the, with the web application. And at that point, you know you have most of the company ready to start porting. You don't own all of these products and libraries because sideways some team has developed an application and they have a library only for themselves. Well, you ask them, you include, engage owners to continue working on these things and continue porting their own libraries as examples are given already with hundreds of libraries we ported. Literally, I think in initial effort like this, we ported already 50 or 60 libraries and that was enough for most of the people to bootstrap them to start their own. I mentioned the need for multi-version testing. So how do you ensure that a new guy walks onto the team, starts changing the code, and breaks Python 3 compatibility? How do you ensure that doesn't happen? Well, we have a very much of automation at LinkedIn, continuous integration. So the best way is to automate these kinds of things. And multi-version testing is a plugin we added to our build system, extension actually, that ensures that when you declare this library supports version 2.6.2.7.3.5, it will run, build, and tests with every of these versions. How are you going to execute that in your specific case depends really on your build infrastructure. So do you use a tool like Tox? Maybe. If you're a pure Python shop, why not? Great. Go for it. Actually, we used to have an old build system that was pure Python. We kind of used talks for the, these kinds of things. However, I will explain later, but we use Gradle for building pretty much everything at LinkedIn. And when I started looking into how much I would have to customize and maintain the configuration of talks to prevent it to do normal default things, it was cheaper for me to just implement the Gradle extension for that. Because that's our system. It may not work for you. As I said, use the normal Python tooling if you need for, for yourself. Conditional dependencies was another extension we added. And it was needed because, as I mentioned, some of the packages are backports and they are not needed on Python 3. So you really have the conditional dependencies that are depending on the version of Python you use. There's a PEP for that, 508, um, environment markers. That PEP is supported with recent versions of setup tools, I think higher than 18, and uh, also wheels higher than 024 support the environment markers. So you can basically do something like that and ensure that your Python package metadata is correct. What we have done is provided also a custom Python class that every of our products has in setup by one of the options you can put in the setup call is this class. So we provided a special distutils class that is bridge between Gradle and Python, and you will see how that works. So this is a Gradle, so not Python, Gradle code, actually Gradle configuration for, for a part of, of our product. You see the dependencies? Python is so-called configuration in Gradle terms, which means my runtime dependencies, basically. And most of the time you don't need the parentheses around that, but in this particular case, you do because you have this extra braces that say environment markers for it, for the thing in the parentheses, uh, are Python 2.6 and Python 2.7. We made shortcuts so our developers don't need to write complex uh, comparisons. Uh, you will see how this translates. This was an interesting case where Avro is a package on Python 2, and there's a separate package for Python 3 called Avro Python 3. So they have kind of uh, mutually exclusive uh, conditions there. One is only with Python 3, the other one with 2.6 and 2.7. This translates by Gradle during the build. PyGradle takes this 
and translates into a file called pin.txt, which now you can see other dependencies, like Avro JSON serializer is a normal dependency, any version of Python. LIPY utils is our internal package. That's also normal package with normal version. However, these guys translated into Avro 133, Python version equals 2.6, or Python version equals 2.7. So this is a translation. We wanted our developers to avoid this complicated thing, and, and this translates automatically. And then Avro Python 3 translates into Python version greater than or equal to 3.4. So then this Gradle, Gradle distribution class that's in setup.py of every internal package translates that and injects into setup as install requires and extras require. And you can see this is a format. You can find it officially on PEP and on setup tools or real um, documentation. This is exactly format how you should have it. And you notice how now all the packages that have conditional dependencies, Avro, config, parser, enum34, were listed under 2.6 and 2.7 only. They're, those are backports. And the only one that's needed for three was Avro Python 3. And that, when you build a Python package and you look inside eginfo slash requires txt, you will see something like this. Three dots are normal packages, say um, Avro JSON serializer, but these two sections are conditional sections. And now your metadata is correct, and whoever is consuming this package we can put it on PyPy, and it will be consumed correctly no matter which version of Python you use. Also, if you build wheels, which we do for deployable products, because we pack them into little containers called Python executable packs from Twitter. Um, so this is translating into the correct metadata in the wheel as well. Make sense? So let's see what were the challenges we had. The subtitle on these, under these titles is really, what does this mean? So if you have platform issues, that means literally translates into slower adoption of your stuff. So people will not use things that don't work for them, of course. So one of the problems was, hey, we built our product and it doesn't work. Well, we start investigating why it doesn't work. Oh, you didn't add multivariant builds, matrix builds, so you built it only for Red Hat 6, and now you're deploying it on Red Hat 7, and libffi is in a higher version than on Red Hat 6, and it bails out. In C API, it bails out. So, of course, just add that another variant build and you will get Red Hat 7 build and deploy Red Hat 7 to Red Hat 7, Red Hat 6 to Red Hat 6, Darwin to Darwin, you know, match the things and everything will work. Um, also, minor release of the operating system, amazingly enough, can release a different version of OpenSSL that may be kind of incompatible. Or major release of operating system with another vendor stops de delivering headers. So you can't build anything. Apple uh, decided that OpenSSL was not all the only old version, but was also undesirable and unsafe, and they wanted you to use their own APIs. But as we know, open source programs depend on OpenSSL, you, so you need to build, and you need headers. So what do you do? Well, turns out our security and traffic folks already built RPM for OpenSSL for their own purposes, and they want to control their life and their security. So the only thing missing was uh, Darwin version. So we used the same technique as with Clean Python. We built versions that are both uh, Darwin and Red Hat 7 and Red Hat 6 and produced custom OpenSSL product, which is a long-term support version, recent version, modern, so it, it's, it's more safe also than the one distributed by the vendor. And then we linked every of Clean Python products against that OpenSSL, which is in the similar path just instead of Python, it's an open SSL path um, on our machines. So the other issue is the dependency issues. As I mentioned before, you need to improve your tooling for these kinds of things. So what was the problem here? Gradle uses Ivy, which is a format developed with Java in mind. 
and it didn't have conditional dependencies. Just didn't think about that kind of concept. And uh, you have to suddenly bridge Ivy to Python metadata. So what we've done, is you, as I already described, we built those extensions so that we could kind of pack and produce correct metadata. Also notice one, one other thing. Once you have these metadata correctly, everything is cool. But when the migration starts, you don't have them. You have the old metadata. And you have dependencies that really are not, shouldn't be there, like subprocess 32. So your, your extension for uh, environment markers has to be able to exclude those transitive dependencies that shouldn't be percolating up. Um, and you should be able to kind of stop them in their tracks until you migrate whole code base and get, and get correct metadata in. So that's, that's one of the part of the, of the extension that was kind of unusually needed. Although officially, once you have the correct metadata, you don't need it anymore. Code base issues. So what can happen with the code base issues is that tight coupling. And this is an interesting situation also. If you have, and it does matter whether you are monorepo or multi-repo. That's a big war, I, I understand, in the community as well. Because you solve the same kind of problems. Uh, people who use monorepo, and we were once of them three, four years ago. We migrated since then to multi-repo. We are solving the same kinds of problems. If you have tight dependencies, if you have a diamond in the dependency graph, it doesn't matter whether it's mono or multi-repo, you have to break the diamond because you update the thing at the bottom of the diamond. Now suddenly you need to update two or three things above it, but you cannot, you're gonna break the thing at the top of the diamond because unless you upgrade all of them at the same time. And that's usually impossible. Breaking that kind of dependency is a better approach. We learned that when we were migrating to 2.7 only initially, there was a cluster for our deployments called Apollo and cluster of dependencies, when we broke that up, then Python 3 thing was way easier. So loosely coupled is better than tightly coupled. One other interesting experience, kind of lesson learned, we were open sourcing PyGradle at the same time when we were adding the Python 3 support, and basically people committing with two different goals in mind, stepping over each other's toes all, all the time, but it worked out eventually. Uh, build system requirements, so why do we use Gradle? Who in the right mind uses a Java tool to build Python products? Well, every big company that uses Java or some other language has a need eventually for some other languages on the side. Your creative SREs will start using Go or Python or whatever. And if you can use the same tooling to audit, to track, to have that transparency, that's great. And that's why we did that. We have one of the top-notch Gradle developers on our team. And we decided to go the same way with Python. That really opened uh, a lots of things for our developers who needed, say, deployment hook in Python for Scala product that has a front end in JavaScript and it just builds all together, the polyglot builds. And one other nice thing about this system, you could say, hey, build out has the same thing. It's pluggable, it's extensible. Sure, but does it do Java well? It doesn't. While this thing did Java perfectly well, and it also turned out writing Python plugin, PyGradle wasn't that bad, and it wasn't that difficult, so we used it. And it provided pluggability, which is basically ease to add a feature that produces a different kind of artifact, in this case, Python PEX. Um, it's flexible in a sense that it's easy to customize one specific product. So you just add a piece of groovy code in that configuration file and you customize your one single product if you need to. And finally, extensible, you add extensions like multivariant testing or our conditional dependencies environment markers very, very easily. With our old build system that was pure Python, these polyglot builds were impossible. And also use of a bunch of tooling 
in the company was impossible. So finally, we reached the porting stage, and there will be much more Python code in there. So how did we start? As I mentioned, we looked at the graph and then started from the bottom up. Um, we modernized the code by running the tool, Python Modernize. Then we run the tests, and we find out what needs to be else fixed manually, and we look in those examples. And then we upgraded the PyGradle version, which was providing these new features inside the configuration, um, provided the correct environment markers, bumped the major version of the package, released it, and then went on up the graph. So this is how we set up the configuration to ensure multi-version testing and by that ensure the compatibility. Notice that I personally prefer to put the, the default version of Python to build with to be 3. We can now use 3.6, of course. This is a little older. Um, so why I like that? Because it fails early. If, the, if it breaks Python 3 compatibility, that's, that's the first build that's going to fail instead of the third one. <laughs> So I like that. And then this other extension versions, supported versions, basically will enforce it to build uh, with all three and test with all three versions of Python. It's smart enough to recognize, hey, my default is 3.5. Therefore, here I can skip and not build with 3.5 because I already did by default. Uh, Suspicious code patterns that you will see during the migration and you should be able to recognize. Sometimes they are a natural process of Python 3 changes to Python 2, but sometimes they are just a process of your original code. And um, people are not bad programmers or bad people, but we come from different backgrounds and we are perhaps new to Python or whatever is the reason, sometimes we do silly things and make our life more difficult, make assumptions that we shouldn't be making. So don't judge them, just kind of help them fix the things or fix it for them, they will be grateful. Um, so that's, that's my suggestion, but uh, we'll look into these examples. One note about the code examples, I have uh, taken out the names of the classes and methods because they don't fit very well on the slides. If you have a class with two, three words and method with two, three words, you have nothing else to put on the slide. So I shortened it like c.m, class.method. Uh, but otherwise, uh, examples are quite representative. Also, even when I talked internally about this, um, I didn't want to you know, shame people publicly. Uh, somebody could find on the code search you know, this code otherwise. So that, that was also hiding and protected unsuspecting people. And also, I put ellipses in the places that were irrelevant. One more note before we go into the code examples about the deployable products. As I mentioned before, you don't need to provide multiple version code. Just go straight to Python 3. And uh, that's what I've done with a couple of products. One example, web app, and um, a command line tool called Generate Skeleton. Uh, for example, subprocess in Python 3.5 replaced all of the check, check output, call with subprocess.run. And I just use that everywhere. You simplify your things. Just use straight Python 3. Unless you are depending on a package that's not ported to Python 3, which is nowadays rare. But in that case, just use straight Python 2.7 for now on a deployable. So I put a, a collection of some silly things dependency on dictionary order, uh, not following the language idiom properly, certain gotchas with uh, ordering operators in Python 3 and 2 differences, uh, Unicode strings and strings bytes. That's a well-known one in code decode calls where you put them namespaces. People sometimes coming new to Python don't understand namespaces and they make mistakes with them. And then um, this was actually silly in Python itself. Like, why did we have three URL lib things? That was consolidated in Python 3, which is good. So let's start with, uh, with misguided assumptions that people make. 
Not intentionally, as I mentioned, but they do. Their code works perfectly fine in Python 2, and then suddenly you go to Python 3 and everything is breaking randomly and strangely and you don't know why. So I put this quote, I like it a lot, because when you these, make these kinds of assumptions, it's very similar to speculation on the stock market. Don't do it in any month of the year. Just don't make assumptions that you're not sure about. So, dictionary order. Well, I heard that Python 3.6 has dictionary that's kind of stable order. Don't rely on it yet, still. It's not, and if you work with any other version of Python, you definitely don't want to rely on dictionary order. Um, what happens is mostly the tests get flaky and fail randomly, but if it's in runtime code, it's very pernicious, very hard to debug and reproduce because it's random. So you must root out that code. Here's an example. Here's a nice little dictionary called valid operators. It has some comparison operators there in a certain order. I don't know why this order, but that was the order. And it worked perfectly fine with Python 2. Well, the code using it worked perfectly fine. And here it is. Blue code is the old code. Green code is the new one, like green good. So blue code was basically iterating through that um, dictionary getting key and operator, operation being the operator.le, operator.eq, and then peaking, consuming, and fetching operand behind the operator. So it would be something like greater than or equal one. So they would peak, oh, there's greater than or equal, let me fetch a number behind it. Well, that started breaking. And when I debugged it a little when I was my modernizing this library, I realized, oh, so greater than gets first in, gets consumed, and then instead of one, I get the equal sign. And it bails out, it says this is not the number. So the fix was fairly simple. For that kind of operation, I sorted it in reverse order on key length. So I ensure that greater than or equal or less than or equal is before greater than or less than. So it will be consumed first if it's present. Of course, the real fix would be write a solid parser for this rather than this silly for loop. But um, this, was, this was a way to fix that thing. Next one in the tests. Notice on the, on, the, on the left side, for some reason, name is behind the version up there in the application um, entry on the top. And then in this set, why is 2014 before 2010 and 12? Well, it turns out that that's how it worked for them. Uh, OK, I take and put the, the values in the file the way I feel they should be. 2010, 12, 14, name before the version. Of course, the test breaks. But instead of writing the test in the manner it was written by file comparison, of course, it will fail if you produce a file that has slightly different order because of the dictionaries you're outputting in it. I actually use, they did have a, a method called parse from file. I actually used their own method and, and brought uh, parsed files into two uh, variables and then asserted that they are equal. We use PyTest, by the way, that's why the normal assertion, not assert equal, assert not equal, and things like that. PyTest allows you to use this um, custom, normal kind of assertions. Also, wrapper outputs. So, interestingly enough, set wrapper changed in Python 3. So, set used to be set parentheses brackets when you produce a wrapper of empty set, but in Python 3 it's set parentheses only. So, I had to introduce, for example, this uh, conditional expression right here well, on the next to the last line, set parentheses if 6 pi 3, else set parentheses bracket, because then it will match depending on Python version correctly, one or the other wrapper. So those are sli slight differences between Python versions that you have to be aware of, obviously. So overall, reconsider your assumptions. Mappings, and I'm using the term mappings, not dictionary, deliberately. They are not guaranteed to keep the order of the keys because JSON objects are a mapping. That's JavaScript object, really. Um, 
XML attributes. Somebody asked me when I was presenting this uh, part in, uh, in the talk on craftsmanship, well, XML has schema. Yes, it does have schema. I'm talking about attributes. On a single, single line, single angle bracket, those are attributes. They don't have the ordering. Schema does, but attributes don't. Also, notice that one of those schemas was set, and inside set, there is no ordering again. So even inside the schema may not be the order. So. Another pet peeve of mine is the idiomatic use of a language. When we learn a natural language, we try to learn idiom to speak it as natively as possible. I am a big proponent of doing the same for any programming language. Because otherwise, you'll be writing Fortran programs in any language. So here's a nice, interesting code that I saw. If key in d dot keys, you run Python modernize on this, and it produces if key in list d dot keys. Now this list is absolutely necessary to preserve the semantic correctness, because if this wasn't a list in Python 2, it was, but in Python 3, it's a generator. And they don't know that you can use the generator there, the, the, the automated tool doesn't know that. It knows it was a list in Python 2, I have to keep it a list in Python 3 as well. So, but it's kind of good, because it warns you how, how something wrong is here you know, happening. So what happened is really that whoever used this, maybe coming from Java and knowing about uh, mapping dot uh, key set, Maybe that was the reason why they wrote it this way. Um, but they just traded a Pythonic if key in D, which is a O1 lookup into a hash table, with a lookup into a list, which is O of N, which for a big list can be a big problem. So that was my reaction, basically, when I saw that code. And Let's proceed towards the namespaces. As I mentioned, new developers in Python sometimes don't understand namespaces correctly. And they start doing uh, things like, hey, we have this LinkedIn namespace. Let me just add a module into it. Well, if you know a little about namespaces, you understand that they should have just done their init pi with a special incantation inside and nothing else. No other code should be there. So how to fix this now? You know, they try to emulate something that we've done in the base libraries, but how to fix this? So I had to move every xxx.py into xxx dot slash xxx.py. So make it a package with the same name. And as much as I hate the star imports, you have to use the star import inside the dunder init of that package to re-export the same way as it was for backward compatibility, unless you can break for backward compatibility, which you can't always do. And of course, the doc also has to be re-exported. And if you have documentation, all our uh, internal libraries uh, have the API documentation generated by Sphinx, Sphinx automatically and set up the things properly. So then you have to take care of that with imported members as well. If they did anything creative, and I had one of packages like that, some monkey patching for LinkedIn XXX, then I had to monkey patch LinkedIn XXX XXX. It happens. Somebody talked this morning about the linters and static analyzers. It was a nice talk. And uh, this was a similar example. We don't know what to do with this warning. Let's just ignore it. And they set up ignore f some number. Well, I, I tend to repeat to our developers, if it's just a style error, I don't mind if you ignore it. But those f errors are static analyzer errors. Better, better look what's going on. And this was kind of interesting. What is actually wrong with the first line in blue? Maybe again, coming from another language, you think the comma there should be used. or, or for the message, but the, it was basically saying that this is always true. And when I looked a little better, I said, oh, this is a tuple with a string inside it, 
that is not, not, not empty. And you know, this is a non-empty non tuple. It's always true. It's true. You're testing nothing. And it has to be rewritten the way I rewrote it in, in, the, in the bottom line. Um, another idiomatic thing that we like to do um, is an old saying from Craig Hopper, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than get permission, or the proverb, look before you leap. So which technique you like to use? Um, take a look at uh, Martelli's Python in a nutshell. He'll explain it very well there. Um, so LBYL, look before you leap, is used widely in C programming. If this condition, then return. If this condition, then error. You know, and then when you clear up all the possible problems, then we actually do the job in the C function. But in Python, it's uh, most of the time preferable to, to use EAFP because it's more readable and clear and don't repeat yourself. And Actually, in the case of uh, file system operations, uh, you don't have race condition, which you can have with if, because if the operating system makes a context switch on after the if, you could try using something that's not there anymore. So several advantages. But here, the advantage was actually during Python 2 to 3 migration. Look at the code at the top. It's using if is instance file name file. Now, if you look at Python 3, file doesn't exist anymore as a type. It was removed. So this code, if it used try except instead of if, wouldn't have failed. And there is an old rule in Python, generally dynamic languages. Do not test for type, test for features. So if they just tried file name dot names, is it a file-like object? It would work. But this way it failed because of that type check. Another example where EAFP could be useful is in tests. Sometimes your tests, um, you can't control whether certain uh, sets are returned in one or another order. So we have an, uh, one example where expected is a certain order of metrics, and another reordered is the other situation that happens in the test. So you can, in that case, just put a try try with matching with one expected order, and if it, you get assertion error, try matching with another. One of them will succeed if your test is good. Otherwise, if something's going wrong, both of them will fail, and you, your test will still show that something is wrong if something's wrong, really. Now, for the Python changes themselves, what's happening there? I mentioned the comparisons. So you don't have CMP anymore in Python 3. Um, you are usually supposed to write two of the comparison operators, usually EQ and LT, equal and less than, and then use functools total ordering on the class. And this is a typical implementation of a comparable class. So EQ is just, hey, is it equal to each other in terms of being equal uh, in terms of specific attribute on a class? If not, just return not implemented. And for less than, you use the similar approach. I didn't want to, didn't have space actually on the slide. Um, but now, what's the problem with that? In Python 2 func tools total ordering, there is a subtle bug or misfeature where it will, if you have a complicated comparison in your, in your EQ and it returns not implemented or things like that, you will get true for both EQ and NE. Well, the things can be true for both equal and not equal, or false for both. And I've seen examples in the tests, actually, of that. So Python 3 has optimized that implementation in C. And this is a direct translation of that C code into the Python code, qualified with if 6 pi 2. So this is done only with Python 2. You don't need it with Python 3. And what it does is really takes the um, equal, and then it says if that's not implemented, return not implemented. Otherwise, return not of that opposite. So we always at least ensure that it's opposite of EQ, which is how it should be. And uh, also do remember that hash by default returns an ID of an of a object in memory. So if you need something else, that usually you do. Please do implement it. 
strings versus bytes, the famous topic between Python 2 to Python 3 conversions. Uh, here's a typical example. We had a very simple line um, coming in. We didn't care whether it's strings or bytes. Actually, it was probably bytes, but it was coming as a string in Python 2, and we just split lines, and everything is hunky-dory. However, with Python 3, we have to be careful, because if it's not Python 3 or it's not bytes, we know it's string, we're going to return the packet. But otherwise, we have to decode it into a string and then work with it as a string. Otherwise, split lines will fail. There's a ton of other examples in the internal talks on craftsmanship. I presented them. I really don't have time or space here for that. But my advice, convert immediately on the edges of interface. You send a request, convert right before send. You got the response, convert immediately after response, and use just the strings internally. That keep your, keeps your sanity, basically. And that's the right thing to do with Python 3. But don't forget to add the tests if you have the libraries that have support both. Add the tests with B explicitly passed in so to ensure that it actually works with bytes. Because this thing didn't have a test, and it was happily passing tests, although it was really not working. And when the B test was added, that was discovered. Know the binary APIs. Which of these APIs in Python 2 or 3 are binary and which are not? Especially in Python 3, you need to know which ones return bytes. As, as uh, my colleague Barry Warsaw pointed out, the most fun are those that accept both. <laughs> so you need to know which ones are those. So here's an example where we need to pass actually bytes in Python 3. And I suggest make these little functions like ensure bytes here. Because you're going to write a lot of this code if you don't. Um, and that's don't repeat yourself. So this is ensuring that you have a bytes in Python 3 sense, and that you pass then ensure bytes for secret and for body of the, uh, this cryptographic hash. Uh, learn the API changes. Python 3 has uh, make trans on the string class, while previously had to be imported from string module. So try accept. Usually these things help for Python 2, 3 conversions. Try import something. If it fails, accept import error, do import something else. But also with these things like attribute error, it helps a lot because those are the differences between Python 2 and 3. Um, we are coming close to the end now, so the consolidation of the APIs, you need to be aware of them. I mentioned previously you are a lib consolidation, HTTP client from HTTP lib, warning rather than warn, max size rather than max int. Um, those are just some examples. There are other things. Things that were removed, file, if you remember, was removed. TM temp nam was removed. You can use the name temporary file with a width block. Um, Print has become function, of course, you know that, but don't forget to import print function inside the code that supports both from future. Types changed. So SSL string has changed into an enum. So you'll have to account for that maybe with some try except or if 6 by 3 use enum, otherwise use the other one. Um, you have sometimes code that really needs long in Python 2, and, uh, but it wouldn't work with Python 3 because that would be a syntax error. So this is the way to get around that. If it's 6 by 3, long is equal int and everything works fine. You just can put that at the top of the module, it will work just fine. And then uh, meta classes were changed. You don't put meta class attribute on a class anymore. You pass it actually as a parameter to, to the class this way. So six will help again. Six has with meta class, or it has a decorator called add meta class. So you can use that to ha have a compatibility. Exceptions have changed. So you will have, I've seen in the code people using error subscript minus one. Now you have to use args. Uh, no more comma variable, as variable has to be used. Uh, Re-raising the exceptions. Be careful, do not hide the trace back by using raise E. Use just plain raise. Uh, if you use Python 3 purely, say in your deployable code, 
you can have fancy arrays exception from calls to have a nicer trace back to show you where, which chain of exceptions happened. And um, just look through the Python documentation for the exception hierarchy changed, basically. Finally, standard library backports. So a simple JSON, you can use JSON pretty much now. Uh, mock versus unit test mock. If you're using pure Python 3, you can use mock from unit tests. Subprocess, especially Python 3.5, beautiful subprocess.run. Uh, Trollius, we used actually Trollius async IO with Python 2. But it was wonky because it had a yield from with capital F and then like a function call because that was the incorrect syntax in Python 2. Um, so once we switched to async IO really for Python 3, the library that had to be compatible with both, um, I've written a, a Dunder name and Dunder compat name, which one using Trollius, another using async, and then the real name .py was importing one or the other depending on the Python version used. So that's another technique you can use. Um, E3 can use encoding, which is important now because of string and, and, and byte differences. So you can pass the encoding to E3 to properly parse it. So you don't need to worry about co converting for yourself. Another place where you can save yourself from converting is subprocess universal new lines equals true. It will convert for you so you don't need to worry. You know you're getting strings always. Okay, so what's the status right now at LinkedIn? Uh, about 29% of our products, about 300 almost, are building with Python 3 right now. And uh, we are going to push forward for more. So what's the future bringing for us? We just stopped supporting Python 2.6 completely. Final two products that were kind of lingering around, we kind of forced them to do it. Uh, we'll make the Python 3 the default. People who want to stay on 2.7 will be able to stay but they will have to explicitly declare that. And we'll add the pre-commit or build checks to warn about the patterns that are incompatible so people can gradually fix their code before we cut over completely. And then we'll, some of our teams are already using type checking, but we want to extend that more throughout the company. Thank you, that would be all.